committee will come to order. Today we are considering two good government measures. We will consider a bill to strengthen cybersecurity in the Federal Government and a bill aimed at better measuring the Federal Government's performance. We also will consider several post office naming bills and commemoratives resolutions. The committee's first agenda item today is H.R. 4900, the Federal Information Security Amendment Act of 2010. This bill was introduced by Representative Watson on March 22, 2010 and forwarded to the full committee as amended by the Subcommittee on Government Management, Organization and Procurement on May the 5th, 2010. The Federal Information Security Management Act was enacted in 2002 as part of the E-Government Act. FISMA requires federal agencies to assess the state of their information security management each year by conducting periodic risk assessments, categorizing risk, maintaining a detailed inventory of all information systems, and training employees in security awareness. Uh, while FISMA has been an effective tool in improving information security, GAO continues to report persistent weaknesses that require updated legislation. Moreover, cyber threats and attacks against federal information systems have continued to grow in both volume and intensity in recent years. That is why the committee has taken up H.R. 4900, a bill that codifies the multi multiple policy recommendations made by the Obama administration, public-private sector working groups, and GAO for fixing security deficiencies throughout the federal government. Among other things, this bill would establish a national office of cyberspace with a director to be appointed by the president and subject to the Senate confirmation. H.R. 4900 also requires agencies to begin automated and continuous monitoring of their systems, a requirement that the Obama administration recently issued uh, instructions on in April. In closing, I want to take the, the time to acknowledge uh, Ms. Watson, not only for introducing this bill, but also for her hard work in moving it forward. I want to thank the staff likewise, and I want to thank Mr. Conley for his efforts to improve the bill, particularly as it relates to codifying the position of federal chief technology officer. I support that provision and I'm glad it was added at the subcommittee markup a few weeks ago. Last but not least, I want to thank Mr. Issa and his staff for working with me and my staff to refine H.R. Uh, 4900. This has truly been a bipartisan effort. This is a very good bill and I strongly urge the rest of my colleagues to join me in supporting it. Now I yield to the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as you said, a lot of work on a bipartisan basis has gone into taking an extremely good initiative led by uh, Subcommittee Chairwoman uh, Watson and, uh, and worked by both of our staffs. Every day in America, individuals and our government are under attack. The cyberspace boon in, has, has been a boon to industries, innovation, and government access. At the same time, it is clear that with these great advancements have come great risk. Since the establishment of FISMA, the Internet has gone a long way, not all of it in a good direction. So as we seek to create a permanent director to oversee an ever greater threat from both within and without, we need to have this kind of oversight by this committee and these, this kind of innovation uh, and perspiration by people like uh, Diane Watson. So I, first of all, would like to join with you in thanking the gentlelady from California. Additionally, I would like to thank your staff for the diligent work, uh, the amendments be, uh, that are being offered and mutually agreed to. We're, we're worked on a bipartisan basis. We're difficult because this is a difficult area in which the threat is still emerging. But I join with the chairman in urging all to vote for it and yield back. I thank the gentleman from California for his statement. Any other members seeking recognition? The gentlewoman from California, the author of the bill. Uh, Mr. Chairman and ranking member, uh, thank you for holding today's markup on my legislation, H.R. 4900, the Federal Information Security Amendments Act of 
2010. I appreciate your enthusiastic support for the legislation and our collective efforts to strengthen our government-wide cybersecurity posture. Since the enactment of the Federal Information Security Reform Act more than seven years ago, our committee has been proactive in its oversight of the federal government's plans and policies for combating cyber place threats of all kinds. While these efforts detail significant vulnerabilities and threats against government information technology assets, until recently there was little agreement on how to develop a more comprehensive policy framework for securing our federal cyber enterprise. Fortunately, today's markup of H.R. 4900 is another critical step forward in our efforts to establish a more comprehensive and effective cyber security governance policy for the federal government. I believe the bill and the proposed substitute amendment before us achieves our goal of establishing a comprehensive cybersecurity framework that will save, serve the federal government well for years to come. A major component of H.R. 4900 includes the establishment of a national office for cyberspace within the executive office of the president for overseeing and enforcing cybersecurity policy across our agencies. I believe the proposed office's structure and agency participation mechanisms will make information security a more inclusive and collaborative effort among all stakeholder parties and ensure that our agencies have a strong government-wide leader to assist them in their efforts. Furthermore, the bill before us today does more ably reflect our technical capabilities for combating current and emerging threats through new system monitoring requirements and information assurance practices. In order to alleviate particular concerns expressed by some in the vendor community, I'm glad to say that the substitute amendment to be considered shortly includes refinements to ensure that all policies and procedures will remain flexible enough to incorporate new or emergency technologies and remain non-discriminatory in their design and application. Other key provisions in this legislation include new information security requirements for our agency acquisition practices, as well as a proposal by Congressman Connolly to codify the establishment of a federal chief technology officer. Although our enemy is a moving target, I believe these changes as a whole will improve our government's ability to coordinate and defend against the current and emerging cyber threat landscape. In closing, I want to extend my gratitude to uh, you, Chairman Towns, to you, the ranking member, uh, ISA, and my subcommittee ranking member, <clears throat> Mr. Bilbray, as you know, who just recently lost his mother and has not been with us for a few days. And uh, I also want to thank for helping us to shape the legislation that we have before us today, and I ask for its favorable consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, statement. And of course, uh, if there's no other members seeking recognition, I now call up H.R. 4900. H.R. 4900, a bill to amend Chapter 35 of Title 44, United States Code, to create the National Office for Cyberspace, to revise requirements relating to federal information security and for other purposes. I have a, ma manager, I have a manager's amendment at the desk. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4900, offered by Mr. Towns of New York and Mr. Issa of California. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. I ask unanimous consent that the substitute amendment be adopted and considered as original text. Without objection, so ordered. I yield myself um, five minutes. This amendment is truly a bipartisan one. 
In addition to making a number of technical edits and enhancements to the bill, it gives the Director of National Office for Cyberspace Hiring Authority and outlines a time frame for their office to be established. The amendment also broadens the scope of minimum, minimum security requirements for products and services to be used in agencies' information systems. It encourages the Federal Cybersecurity Practice Board to engage with the international community on information security and industry partners on information sharing. This is a good amendment, and even more so, a good example of working together across the aisle to find middle ground and create a strong bipartisan product. Are there any, I yield to the, actually the ranking member, I was so, I'm taking this bipartisan stuff too far, huh? Not a bit, not a bit, Mr. Chairman. You've said it all. Uh, this is a mutually agreed uh, and completely vetted uh, amendment. I urge all my colleagues to vote for it. Uh, I believe that it has taken a good piece of work done by the gentlelady from California and perfected it. And uh, with that, I yield back. Hearing no amendments, the question is on agreeing to the H.R. 4900 as amended. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 4900 as amended is agreed to. Without objections, H.R. 4900 as amended is ordered reported favorably to the House. H.R. 2142, the bill now, H.R. 2142, the Government's Efficiency, Effectiveness and Performance Improvement Act of 2009. We call up the bill. H.R. 2142, a bill to require the review of government programs at least once every five years for purposes of assessing their performance and improving their operations and to establish the Performance Improvement Council. The bill will be considered as read. H.R. 2142 was introduced by Representative Henry Cuellar. I appreciate Mr. Cuellar's hard work on this bill and his commitment to sharing his expertise in the area of performance assessment. I thank Chairwoman Watson for her leadership in moving this bill and for her continuing efforts to improve government. This legislation builds on the Government's Performance and Accountability Act that was passed by Congress in the, uh, 1993. The GPRA was enacted to improve the efficiency and accountability of federal agencies and to improve the information Congress has available when making decisions about funding and oversight. GPRA requires agencies to make long-range strategic plans and annual performance plans and report annually to the, to their, on their progress. H.R. 2142 strengthens GPRA's focus on performance management and provides greater accountability by requiring more frequent and detailed GAO reviews of agency efforts. The bill also codifies some elements of an executive order and performance management issued by President Bush. The Government Management Subcommittee adopted a substitute amendment by voice vote when it considered H.R. 2142 on May the 12th, 2010. The substitute offered by Mr. Cuellar incorporated feedback from OMB, GAO, and others. Mr. Cuellar's substitute sharpened the focus of the bill by requiring agencies to identify high priority goals and evaluate at least four times each year whether those goals are being met. The bill approved by the subcommittee requires agencies in consultation with OMB to identify goals that can be objectively measured and that have a high value to the public. This legislation makes the performance measurement process more transparent. It requires OMB to make available with the President's budget a list of agencies' goals and the approach that will be used by agencies to measure their performance in meeting those goals. OMB must give Congress and the public the opportunity to provide feedback on the goals and the methods each agency plans to use. The bill also holds agencies accountable by requiring that the results of performance assessments be made available online. Mr. Cuellar has put a great deal of effort 
into crafting a bill that will make the government work a whole lot better. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting this legislation, and I yield uh, five minutes to the ranking member for his comments. The gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this, like the previous bill, is a good piece of base legislation that has been worked on through the committee process. Although the original bill that Mr. Cuellar uh, submitted uh, was, in fact, in my opinion, an improvement but extremely similar to one that Congressman Platts introduced in a previous Congress, I feel that it has gone less in the right direction than I would have liked. This is not uncommon in Congress. In Congress, we have high expectations for what we are going to hold the administration to, and the administration has high aspects of being able to take the money and run. This is no exception that there has been pushback by the administration. But I am proud that on a bipartisan basis we have been able to come to, for the most part, middle ground. Mr. So Chairman, I will be offering an amendment, which is an agreed-on amendment in the form of a substitute, that will take care of many of the issues that have been agreed to as part of a compromise to weigh and balance three, three important issues. First of all, what will be the measure of administration success? What tools will be used and how often it will be measured? I believe that this is a compromise. It is a compromise between Republicans and Democrats. It is a compromise between this body and the management and budget end of the White House. So with that, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I expect to support both this bill and the final, uh, both the amendment and the final passage, and uh, would yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman from California for his statement. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cuellar, to speak on his legislation. Yes, sir. Uh, I believe I have an amendment at the desk. It's uh, no, it's opening statement. It's over the same amendment. Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman uh, Towns and Ranking Member Ice, I want to say, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, for this opportunity, and I want to thank the, the committee, starting off with our chairwoman from the subcommittee, Ms. Watts, uh, that took this along with a lot of the uh, members that worked so hard. We put in a lot of effort on this, trying to find a balance uh, on this uh, on this particular bill. Took some ideas from the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, and of course the current administration. We've been working on this very hard. There's, uh, it was a very open process, and I believe it's a bipartisan support. Uh, uh, even Robert Shea, who led the Performance Improvement Initiative at the OMB under President George W. Bush, sent out an uh, op-ed uh, in support of this. Uh, we have been working in a bipartisan way. In fact, there is uh, some of the latter part of the changes that we added uh, was working with the minority staff. Uh, certainly the majority staff and the minority staff, we have been working on this, trying to find a balance on this issue that I think is very important. Bottom line is that we can't measure results. Uh, then we don't know if we're going the right direction. And this is basically what this bill uh, does with the changes that you mentioned. Um, we worked with uh, uh, Ranking Member Issa and your staff, and I know we incorporated a lot of the things that, uh, that you wanted in there, and we really appreciate this. And uh, it's, um, it's, a, um, it's, it's something that I think we'll see, uh, one of the bigger changes we'll see in the last uh, 17, 18 years, and I think it's important that we do this in a bipartisan way. So, members, I ask for your support on this piece of legislation. Any other members seeking recognition? Mr. Chaffee. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chaffee. Thank you. I just moved Gentleman to strike the last word. I, look, I, I appreciate most uh, any effort to, for openness and transparency. One, one of the tools and things that I looked to before I came to Congress was a, a, web, a website that was run by the Office of Management and Budget called expectmore.gov. And while this is not directly relating to this bill, it does have relevance to this bill and what we would expect an administration to put forward in terms of indicators to the public so that they can uh, uh, um, uh, extract information and come to their own conclusions as well. In part, I'm making a statement, but part a question, and perhaps somebody knows more, but it does not appear that expectmore.gov is continued to be updated by the current administration. This, what expectmore.gov did is it took the 1,000-plus programs that are out there and created a dashboard indicator so that the public could access that information and be able to see, based on a set of objective criteria, whether or not those programs were adequately performing, inadequate in their performance. And so, again, if somebody has more insight about what is happening to this, what is not happening to this, and how that the public component will come into play so that the public can have access to these types of reports and this type of information, at least in the past, under expectmore.gov, it was a very useful tool, 
uh, as a dashboard indicator as to what was happening and not happening with these thousand plus programs. And with that, I'll yield back, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Gentlemen, yield back. Yeah. Recognize the gentleman from Texas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, excellent questions. And, and one, of, one of the things that we wanted to make sure was that there was that availability, that information, not only to the members of Congress, because we are the ones that provide legislative oversight. And I think that's one of the most important legislative duties that we have if we get the right information in a way that we can understand and manage that information. So that information will be provided on the, on the website, on the internet, to make sure that not only we look at it, but also make sure that we uh, provide input and they take the input from us, number one. The other thing is the public. I certainly want to get the public involved, and I think by the openness and the transparency that will be available, I think uh, the websites, the internet, I think this will provide uh, the openness uh, to make sure that the, the taxpayer knows that if we're spending one dollar, how are we spending that one dollar? And if we are making some improvement plans, uh, because eventually, you know, as we do the assessments and we get the GAO and the Inspector Generals involved, to make sure that those improvement plans are also available uh, to the public also to make sure that we all know that we're going the right direction after we find Will the a gentleman yield for just a few seconds? I, I would just encourage uh, and love to work with you on this. I'm not trying to slow this down. I'm very supportive of this effort. I'm just saying I would hope that uh, that you, the, the both sides of the aisle, and the administration could work towards uh, one of the byproducts potentially looking and functioning like expectmore.gov. I think it worked well. It's not the end-all, be-all. There's certainly a plethora of more additional information that can be added to it, but just to encourage you to look at that and look forward to working with you on it. Appreciate it. I think it. Congressman Ice's amendment actually covers it. And I say, I, yeah, I was going to say, and I, I'll let the, the ranking member talk about sure. that, but I think in your amendment you had a specific uh, provision on that, and I'll let the ranking member. It does provide that, and one of the things that, that the ranking member did was that he added a lot of specificity that, that I thought it was important that he brought up, uh, and I'll let the ranking member answer that question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, this you. might be a good time to say I have an amendment at the desk. <laughs> no, 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 not yet. <laughs> not, not yet. Okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll wait until and explain it when I explain the okay, amendment. Okay, all right, very good. Any other members seeking recognition? Yes, the gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. No, no, not, no, no, you have to wait. We'll, we'll, wait. We'll, we'll get this as opening statements if you, yeah, okay. I now call up um, H.R. 2142. H.R. 2142, a bill to require the review of government. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Mr. Without Chairman. Objection to order. Gentleman from California. I have an amendment at the desk. Wait, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you've got. Oh, you've got a substitution. We've got to do first. him. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Good, Men, good amendments here. So, uh, you know, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cuellar. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2142 offered by Mr. Cuellar of Texas. Without objection. Uh, on that. So there is uh, specific uh, changes uh, to make sure that, uh, that the agencies consider the public comments when they're establishing their goals and the performance evaluations to make sure that there's a high direct value to the public. Because again, we're not just, we don't want to see paperwork just to see paperwork, but we want to make sure that we are looking at measurable outcomes and getting the public involved. And this is what the uh, changes uh, are set up. And again, I want to thank the uh, minority for working with us. I recognize the gentleman from California. You know, under the circumstances, I would recommend that we adopt this uh, amendment as base text and move the previous question so we can adopt it as base text and move on to uh, further amendments. Yeah. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as original text and without objections so ordered. I support Mr. Cuellar's amendment. I appreciate the efforts he has made to address the concerns of some members of the committee, OMB, GAO, and of course others. 
this amendment makes several improvements to the bill. One change I would like to highlight is that the amendment requires agencies to consider any public comments received on the agency's goal. The amendment also requires OMB to provide a summary of public comments and to disclose any adjustments made by agencies to their goals based on those comments or at the direction of OMB. I hope every member of the committee will support this amendment. Do any other members wish to be heard on this amendment? Are there any amendments to the Quayar substitute? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment uh, to that who, to the amendment in the form of substitute. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2142 offered by Mr. Issa of California. I ask unanimous consent that it be considered as read. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and I recognize the ranking member for five minutes to speak on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I said in my opening statement, this is an amendment that we believe has been hard worked out on a bipartisan basis to do a number of things. Uh, and, I, and I want to congratulate the gentleman from Texas for his amendment and his willingness to go further in a bipartisan way. A number of things are done by this. This amendment uh, does create and beef up, actually beefs up, the GAO review process of each agency on, on performance assessment, something that we very much want to have. Working with the majority, we agreed to a mutually agreeable time so as not to overly burden nor overly cost the GAO its time and, and monies. We believe that it creates a system of measurements that can be uh, built upon in the future, but it takes us a long way. It also uh, details information and programs that are uh, failing or dupl duplicative, and we felt that this was an area that uh, we had been working on that, would go, uh, that needed to go further. Finally, the amendment increases the transparency of the performance information produced by the, produced by the agency. This amendment requires that uh, performance information be linked to the spending data on the USAspending.gov and requires the administration to study the feasibility of a single web por portal for all spending and performance information. Mr. Chairman, this goal is one that you and I have shared for a long time. Additionally, it is a goal that watchdog groups and good government oversight groups have been championing for a very long time. In a day and age in which you and I are working so hard to have interoperable databases, single standards for particular types of data, this will be an attainable goal and one that this and all legislation should continue to move us toward. I believe that particularly the development of a single website for performance information and, quite frankly, transparency of spending is critical. It's one that this bill helps to move along at as fast a pace as we can. I would urge support for this amendment and yield back the balance of my time. I'm prepared to support this amendment. I appreciate the ranking member's willingness with work with, to work with me and Mr. Cuellar to address some of our more significant concerns. The ranking member's amendment requires agencies to assess their annual performance goals on a semi-annual basis. Uh, GPRA currently requires agencies to assess these goals annually. I am concerned that this change may overburden agencies. It will require agencies to vote significantly more resources towards performing goal assessments. I want to be sure that agencies perform thorough and, and meaningful assessments and uh, am concerned that this change could turn these assessments into paperwork exercises. Uh, the amendment also contains measures to improve the transparency of performance information. It is important that Congress and the public have access to the performance information and that the information be presented in a form that is useful and easy to understand. I will support the ranking member's amendment. Do any other members wish to be heard on the amendment? The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Thank Quayle. you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh do you support the amendment uh, uh, offered by Mr. Issa of California? I think the additions that he adds to the performance plan uh, is good, uh, especially there's a couple of parts that I do want to emphasize. The, uh, the part where, to the same practical, practical, they take into account other efforts that are made at the state, federal, local area. It's good because we get the best practices and see how we can address the issues. I think the, uh, the changes that he made 
that he made dealing with uh, the improvement plans uh, to see what sort of, uh, what are the steps to make sure that we get the improvement expected uh, is something that uh, is, is good. And finally, what you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ice, have been talking about, I think this single web page uh, platform for all government spending, uh, leading to what the gentleman said a few minutes ago, I think that, uh, uh, that uh, effort there will be something that will provide the transparency and hopefully provide us the results-oriented government that we want. So I do support uh, the amendment. General lady from California, Ms. Chu, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. No, no. I, I'm sorry. I, if you um, want to debate the ISA amendment at this time. Oh, I'm sorry. Yours would be next. Yeah, okay. Yes, sort of that. If there's no other members who wish to speak on the ISA amendment, the amendment, the question is on adopting the ISA amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposers say no. In the recognition of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. I now recognize the gentlewoman from California who has a burning amendment. <laughs> yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. <laughs> Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2142 offered by Ms. Chu of California. Ms. Consent that be considered as read. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, first thank my colleague, Representative Quayer, for allowing me to introduce an amendment to his substitute amendment on H.R. 2142. It's uh, important for government to be clear to taxpayers about what it's trying to accomplish and adopt clear goals focused on what's most important to the American people. It's also crucial that federal agencies and programs take into account the needs of disadvantaged and minority communities. My amendment would require federal agencies and programs to do just that. It further amends H.R. 2141 so that more information is provided to the public on how disadvantaged and minority communities are impacted by new and current federal government programs. As we've seen, far too often the specific needs of these communities can be overlooked and go unaddressed. Take the case of the current census and what happened when it reached out to the Vietnamese community. Vietnamese language materials were sent out and the Bureau made some serious mistakes in the translation. A word that they used in Vietnamese for census meant government investigation, which carries a negative connotation because it's associated with the communist regime. While the uh, Bureau scrambled to fix this, it's unclear what the census is doing to ensure that Vietnamese are not, Americans are not alienated from filling out the form and as a result are then undercounted. Perhaps if the needs of the community were properly assessed and studied beforehand, uh, issues like this would not have happened. And then there's the issues of uh, women veterans, still a minority serving in armed services, who are wounded and require prosthetic kneecaps. Uh, but they have gone to the VA only to find out that there are only men's kneecaps available to them. Perhaps if the needs of our service women were recognized and properly assessed beforehand, this would not have happened. My amendment is necessary to ensure that this does not continue to happen as we work on ways to make sure that our government programs are more efficient, performing at the highest standards, and most importantly, are effectively serving the needs of the American people who look to the government for assistance. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, gentlewoman, for her amendment. I now yield to the ranking member. The comments he might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, this is an excellent amendment. I, I cannot necessarily associate myself with each example that, could, that either side could come up with, but there's no question that government should, at all times, when it's doing an assessment, consider populations served. And it is always almost natural to consider the majority, the largest population. You do that without thinking. It is, in fact, by definition, those who are minorities, least represented in those doing the study, those who for whatever reason may in fact not be at the table. So I congratulate the gentlelady. I certainly uh, will support her amendment as good practice by government and yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, California. Any other members seeking recognition on it? I thank the gentleman from California for offer, the gentlewoman from California for offering this amendment. This is a good, a very good amendment that will provide useful information about the impact of agency initiatives 
on disadvantaged and minority communities. If no other member wish to speak on the amendment, uh, the question is on adopting the CHU amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposes no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there any other amendments? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk report the amendment? Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2142 offered by Mr. Chaffetz of Utah. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. I recognize the gentleman from Utah for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, a, a minor adjustment, uh, but I hope that one will be palatable on, on both sides of the aisle to, with all of my colleagues. The senior executive service is on the front line when it comes to implementing the priorities of both Congress and the administration, and the current law requires regular performance appraisals of agency executives. And these, per these performance appraisals, if positive, can lead to increases in grade and compensation. A negative performance appraisal can lead to reductions in both grade and compensation. The law requires these performance appraisals to consider, quote, organizational performance, end quote. My amendment simply requires that the performance appraisals of agency executives specifically consider the agency performance assessments required by this bill. If the performance assessments required by this bill are to be meaningful and result in the improvement of the overall agency performance, we must hold agency executives accountable for actually achieving these goals. The bill already requires the head of each agency to, quote, hold leaders and managers accountable for effective and efficient implementation, end quote. My amendment is intended to implement the spirit of this provision. With that, I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. Anyone else seeking recognition? I, I am prepared to support this amendment. It clarifies existing law to say that the agency performance assessment required by this bill can be used in the performance appraisal of agency senior executives. If no other member wish to speak on the amendment, the question is on adopting the Chafee Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Oppose it. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there additional amendments? Hearing none. I have an amendment. A gentleman from Illinois. from Illinois has an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk read the amendment? Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2142 offered by Mr. Schock of Illinois. If there's no objections, the amendment is considered as read. I recognize the gentleman from Illinois for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, your indulgence, and I appreciate um, my good friend Mr. Quayler's uh, introduction of this bill. Uh, while I support much of the underlying language, uh, there is much information requested. There is much uh, action required by uh, different administration officials, different agencies. Uh, but where I feel there is inaction is in the terms of teeth in this legislation, in terms of true cuts and dollars and cents uh, that we can add up in savings to Americans' taxpayers. Now, I know uh, this is something shared by my friends on both sides of the aisle. Uh, when they go back to their districts, uh, a common theme we're hearing. Uh, the American people are expecting a change in our behavior here in D.C. They're expecting us to spend less, like they are having to at the state government, at the local government, and in their own personal budgets. And they expect systemic reform and a change in way Washington spends and operates their budgets. I believe we've all heard that message loud and clear. My amendment is very simple. Uh, it starts with a bipartisan commission that takes the information that this underlying bill requires, uh, establishes a bipartisan commission, members nominated by the House leadership and Senate, and requires that that bipartisan commission evaluate the information uh, that the underlying bill requires, and to abolish those programs which are not fulfilling their goals, are duplicative or dysfunctional, and simply are serving as a drain on our taxpayer funds. Um, I believe that our massive debt here at the federal government cannot be reduced simply with tax increases. 
but rather it will be done through tough choices made to downsize our federal budget from within. Downsizing that will lead to better fiscal sustainability in the long run and leave a positive fiscal legacy to the next generation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I sincerely hope that uh, this is a, an amendment that can be uh, passed in a bipartisan uh, fashion. As I mentioned, the commission that would be established, the Federal Program Sunset Commission, would be a bipartisan commission. And uh, it takes much of the underlying language uh, in its current form and simply requires action, action uh, that is tangible, uh, that is proof to the American people, the constituents that we represent, that we're serious about cutting. Um, and while uh, there can be much uh, back and forth among Republicans and Democrats about uh, what's fat in government and what's not fat in government, um, I would sincerely hope that if we're passing this legislation to point the finger at ineffective governments, uh, if this agency is going to provide the Congress and the American people with a list of in, uh, ineffective governments, uh, ineffective agencies and programs, that this body, a uh, representative of the people, would require that those ineffective uh, agencies and ineffective programs be then eliminated. Of course, uh, Article I of the Constitution gives the power of the purse to the Congress, so if in fact the Congress does not agree with the Commission, we always have the ability to appropriate, we always have the ability to override uh, but I would simply suggest that it is in uh, the best interest of the taxpayers and all of us that we require the elimination of these programs uh, if, in fact, they are found by the Commission to be duplicative uh, or unnecessary. These ought to be the easy cuts, uh, the easy uh, reductions in, in federal spending that we can all agree on if, in fact, they're found to be duplicative or unnecessary by a bipartisan Commission. And with that, I would uh, ask for a unanimous vote by this committee in supporting such effort, and uh, yield back. I thank the gentleman for his work, you know, I, but I, I, I and, and evidently, you know, he's been working on this for a while. I oppose this amendment, though. Um, under this amendment, a program would be automatically abolished with one year after the commission reviews it, unless it is reauthorized by the Congress. Okay, the, this amendment would force agencies to plead for their lives. And I think it would be a distraction, causing them to be distracted from their missions. Instead of protecting the public, they will be defending themselves and against extinction or being restructured into irrelevance. I think that we have to be careful with that. This amendment threatens all federal programs, all of them. No program would be protected no matter of how popular or how important it, the program is. This commission could eliminate critical programs such as it could eliminate Social Security. It could eliminate Medicare. It could eliminate all these programs. I think that um, uh, we cannot uh, afford this kind of risk. This amendment is not about government efficiency. This is a backdoor effort to undermine our laws. I urge all members of this committee to oppose this amendment, and of course, um, uh, uh, um, because I think that it does not get us to where we need to go. I understand its concern, I understand its frustration, but this is not the wagon that we should be on. I now yield to the ranking member for any comments that he might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I believe this is where we shall part. There is no question in my mind that the American people are fed up with wasteful government spending and runaway deficits. If President Obama is fortunate enough to win re-election and serve his full eight years, at the present trajectory, he will run up more debt than all presidents from George Washington through George W. Bush combined. This is unsustainable. The fact that Greece is in bankruptcy and that if not for us borrowing money from Japan, to loan to the, to the uh, IMF in order to bail out Greece, we, we too would be unable to, to meet obligations. Every month, America is borrowing 40 percent of what we spend on programs, many of them outdated and inefficient. Mr. Chairman, you and I will disagree on this, but the American people expect every program in America to beg for its life every year and to justify it. Every program, including 
Medicare and Social Security must earn their keep every year. The American people count on these programs, but they also count on these programs not being wasteful and inefficient. They count on these programs either doing what they are supposed to do at an effective rate or expiring and being replaced by smaller, more agile programs or no program at all if they serve no purpose. Mr. Chairman, NASA begged for manned space to continue. NASA lost. They were unable to convince the administration to send someone out into space in the next several years. And as a result, in two more shuttle missions, there will be no more manned space for a dec uh, exploration for a decade. I regret that. But in fact, the President made a hard decision, and we will respect that. Mr. Uh, Schock of Illinois is making it very clear that he wants that same level of scrutiny to be on the branch of government that has that obligation. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Illinois. Uh, thank you, uh, the distinguished ranking member. Uh, first, let me respond to some of the what was just said by our, our distinguished chairman. With all due respect, to bring up programs like Medicare and Social Security and suggest that somehow they would be on a list of non-performing or duplicative federal programs, I think, is a bit disingenuous. The fact of the matter is uh, that if, in fact, those programs were on this list, I think you'd find bri uh, broad bipartisan support by Congress uh, to appropriate the money for them. Uh, which, this, which this amendment allows for it. Uh, look, I'm not going to uh, 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 point fingers uh, at the majority. Uh, my party has overspent in years past. The majority has overspent in years past. But I would ask for the, the common sense of my friends on the other side of the aisle uh, to think about this. If we're not willing to put teeth in this legislation to require a program that by a bipartisan commission has been deemed non-performing or duplicative, if we're not requiring that federal spending to be eliminated, what federal spending are we willing to eliminate? And in the, in the scary situation where a program that we all like is put on that list, Congress, through its appropriating process, as we do every year, can override it. But I would hope that my friends on both sides of the aisle, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a little discouraged as, as a new member of this body that there would be this finger pointing of, you know, just this administration or the last administration or it's this one's fault or that one's fault. The fact of the matter is, uh, if we're serious about cutting, which is something that my Republican, Democrat, and independent constituents expect of us, then how come we can't come together in a bipartisan way and support a bipartisan commission? Let's face it, nothing's going to be on this list that both Republicans and Democrats don't agree to because it's a bipartisan commission. And if a bipartisan commission can come together and say this program is non-performing or duplicative, that's the criteria. If the bipartisan commission says it's non-performing and duplicative, why would we not then require its elimination? Uh, but for that, I would argue to my constituents point back home who point to Washington, D.C. and say it's all rhetoric, it doesn't matter who controls Congress, you're all the same. If we're going to pass the underlying language without the necessary teeth to, to require the elimination of these non-performing and duplicative federal programs, then I would raise the question of what we are actually doing here today. I would, I would ask you to consider how genuine you are in truly eliminating duplicative and non-performing federal programs. Because but for the teeth, but for the required action of those programs to be eliminated, we're not going to see any true reduction in federal spending. So I hope this is something that uh, we focus on the future, not the past, and we focus on the fact that this is going to be a bipartisan Sunset Commission, some that I know many on this panel have supported in, in their state positions. I know in, in our state, something that I have supported in years past, uh, that if we can agree, Republicans and Democrats, on a commission of unnecessary spending, I hope then we could, we could agree that it should be eliminated. I yield back. Let, let me just say to the gentleman before I yield to um, uh, the gentleman, uh, Mr. Drehaas, uh, the President is, is very concerned, uh, and the President has already established a commission on deficit reduction that is doing this work. But its recommendations must be approved by the Congress, 
And of course, I think that's very important. And this amendment would terminate programs without input from elected officials. That part really bothers me. Mr. Drehaus, I yield five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, while I appreciate the efforts of <clears throat> the author of the amendment, he, I think he mentioned bipartisan about 10 or 20 times uh, during his speech, but this isn't a bipartisan amendment. If we're going to be bipartisan, let's be bipartisan. And let's engage in bipartisan drafting of amendments that address these situations. To come before this committee and throw an amendment on the table and say this is a bipartisan effort to crack down on government waste without having consulted the majority, without having worked with Democratic members or the author of the bill to talk about bipartisanship. You know, I just think that if we're going to be serious about cracking down on wasteful spending in government, uh, we should work across the aisle. We should work together. That doesn't mean challenging members with amendments and saying pass this or else you're not sincere about your efforts to engage in bipartisan efforts to reduce government waste. It means rolling up your sleeves, sitting down with other members, and working on initiatives to that effect. If we want to do that with the administration, if we want to do that with the author of the underlying bill, then so be it. Let's go ahead and move forward. Um, I applaud the gentleman's efforts and the gentleman's concern when it comes to such waste. I would uh, ask him, actually, to move even further and to look at our tax code and to look at the waste uh, that we have in terms of all of the tax expenditures, the credits, the exemptions, the deductions that are granted around here that further exacerbate the debt uh, and the deficit that we now have. But uh, while I appreciate the gentleman's uh, sincerity, uh, I do think that if we're going to engage in an effort uh, of this magnitude, it, it should be done, you know, in good faith, in a bipartisan manner, in a way that we can come to agreement on um, to, to move forward. So with that, I'm willing to, to work uh, with the member, uh, but I can't support his effort here today uh, because I think it, you know, it is put in front of us uh, in a way to challenge the members rather than to work uh, cooperatively uh, with the members uh, toward the goal that he's trying to achieve. So I'll be opposing the amendment today, but I look forward to working with the member in the future um, on this initiative. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Uh, I thank the chairman. Uh, just to my colleague from the Buckeye State, uh, unless I'm reading a different amendment, it does exactly what he said. It, it, it talks about working in a bipartisan way, about sitting down as, as a commission, rolling up our sleeves, figuring out which programs are redundant, which Will ones the gentleman yield? which ones deserve to be eliminated. I mean Will the gentleman yield? Sure. I, I would just ask the the author of the amendment, did you work with members on this side to draft the amendment and coming up with the program? Well, the I'm yield? talking about the bipartisanship of this amendment. Claiming my time, I yielded I'll be happy to yield to the gentleman from Illinois. Uh, for the record, um, this amendment first of all, uh, I find this a bit ironic. As a member of the minority, usually we're the ones arguing process. Last time I checked, we don't have the gavel. Uh, this amendment was filed uh, in necessary time, was given to your leadership, your leadership staff. It's a yes or no question. Yeah, the answer is yes, absolutely. It was given to you, and, and, and there was discussion that took place. In fact, discussion with the sponsor of the bill prior to coming here, and he, he explained why he was opposed to the amendment. But just because there's support and opposition doesn't mean there weren't attempts for us to work out our differences. But if the only opposition to this amendment is because some disagree with it and there's no real issue with the underlying amendment, then we should pass it. There's been a lot. I, I would urge members to read the amendment. It's very clear. A, a comment was made earlier, again, uh, by our distinguished chairman, that we're going to be taking, uh, we're going to be forced to cut by non-elected officials. The, 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 the commission clearly states there Did will the be members yield? of Congress on the commission. In fact, it's, it, it states uh, the terms on the commission for members of Congress. So uh, again, it, it's been, uh, there's been an effort for this amendment to, be, to get bipartisan support. Uh, I'm appealing to all of those on both sides to support this amendment today. Uh, and the commission is made up of an equal number of Republicans and Democrats and thus will be a bipartisan commission. And furthermore, I just add, this has been attempted before under the Bush administration, who also opposed it. 
So I would suggest that perhaps one of the reasons why there's not complete bipartisan support for this is that whether it's a Republican president or a Democrat president, if those elected members of Congress wish to support the administration, I get it. I get it. But that's why there's not complete support for this amendment, because the administration doesn't support it, because the bureaucracy doesn't support it. And if your party controls the bureaucracy, when it was under Republicans, they supported their administration. When it's under Democrats, they want to support their administration. All I'm suggesting that if we're sincere about making cuts, why can't we trust a bipartisan commission, regardless of whether it's a Republican or Democrat in the White House or running OMB, why can't we trust that bipartisan commission uh, when they've deemed something duplicative and unnecessary, why don't we force them to make the cuts? Would the gentleman from Ohio further yield? yield the ranking member. Ronald Reagan, uh, and I'll quote him as well as I can, once said the closest thing to immortal life is a government program. Uh, the, uh, the gentleman's attempt here is very clear. We have to have a process in order to reduce the size of government, particularly through multiple programs that run through multiple agencies over which no one committee, not even this committee, could reach down and modify. As the gentleman from Ohio, I'm sure, uh, as a freshman has already discovered, each committee of the Congress in both the House and the Senate is a bit of a fiefdom and, and often uh, wants to control its own de in destiny. Would the gentleman I would, yield? Uh, and I will uh, it'll be up to the gentleman from Ohio. But I would suggest this, that if this uh, amendment, as I hope it will, uh, passes here, it is certainly possible to work on it between now and the floor. The uh, chairman, rightfully so, said he had concerns about an automatic process. As someone who has worked on many amendments to amendments over the years in committee, one could certainly take this and turn it into a NAFTA or a fast track type up or down to where Congress would automatically bring a vote to the floor on each uh, proposed uh, rescission and vote them up or down. We have lots of ways in which to deal with this, but to simply not deal with it or assume that an executive order based uh, commission by the President takes the place of congressional action, I think is a failure. I yield back to the gentleman from Ohio. Would the gentleman Mr. Chairman? Yeah. I got just a few seconds left. Look, if the gentleman from Cincinnati wants to vote against a bipartisan process to eliminate wasteful, redundant, ridiculous spending, he can do it. That's the question on the table, and you can't hide behind process. That's the issue in front of us. That's the question before us. Let's vote yes for this amendment. It's a good amendment. Gentlemen, time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, Mr. Drehouse, is, um, his comments are, I think, quite appropriate. But there's something else that we need to consider here. And let's, let's think about this. I don't know about you, but I got elected by about, from a district of 700,000 people. And basically what we're saying here is we're taking away the power of us in the Congress and giving it to an unelected commission. You can write it down, Shock. The fact is, is that that's what we're doing. Now, there may not be anything wrong with that. But at least, as he said, we need to be able to work that out. If you're going to take away the power that my constituents gave me, I mean one scintilla of it, then I want to be in a position to at least go through it, try to figure out what that's all about, and, and figure out whether or not I want to do that. Now, keep in mind that the President uh, created the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility. A lot of people were against that. You know why? They didn't, want, they didn't want to give up the power. Didn't want to give up the power. Did not want to give up the power with regard to raising the age with regard to Social Security. Didn't want to give up the power with regard to tax cuts. Didn't want to give it up. So I think we need to be very, very careful. The other thing that we need to be careful about, and the chairman talked about this, and it may sound like a very simple thing, but it's a very serious thing about agencies pleading for their lives. A lot of agencies are doing a lot of good things. And I think everybody on both sides of the aisle, both sides of the aisle, want efficiency and effectiveness in government. That's what we want. Those are our tax dollars, too. But I think, there, I, I think there's a, as again, the, the gentleman has asked uh, for the courtesy of working with him. He's willing to work. And I applaud him. And I yield to the gentleman. I appreciate the gentleman yielding. And, and I would only suggest, you know, comments have been made here. Um, from, you know, the ranking member has suggested that, uh, you know, as a freshman I may not be familiar 
uh, with the process and the silos that exist. But I did have eight years. It, it, I, I did have eight years in the legislature, eight years where we did go after government waste, where we did crack down, and where we did work across the aisle in order to craft legislation to do so. I am not suggesting that the members' attempts are insincere. What I'm suggesting is that we should work together in order to craft legislation separately and, and introduce that legislation to move it forward. Because this is a challenge when amendment is dropped on us and we're told accept this and it's rather you know, significant in terms of its impact. Now, the ranking member has also suggested repeatedly that we do the work in the committee before it goes to the floor and now we're suggesting that we do otherwise that we clean this up when it goes to the floor. I believe we should work on this in committee. I believe we should work on a bipartisan manner to take the gentleman's ideas, work cooperatively, and see where we can reach agreement. So with that, I again extend the offer uh, to work with the gentleman on his initiative, but I, I, I am not willing uh, to support the amendment today. Let me just say this. There's a vote on the floor. And what I'd like to do is recognize someone on this side and recognize another person on our side, and then Call for a vote. Yeah. Mr. Mr. So Chairman. Then, uh, yeah, a gentleman from uh, Mr. Indiana. Chairman, I, I, I would like to strike the last word and yield my time to uh, the ranking member, Mr. Eisenberg. <laughs> and I won't use the entire five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, it does appear uh, that uh, the gentleman from Ohio misunderstood me. I was giving him the benefit of the doubt that he had learned of the siloing here, and with his eight previous years, it appears as though he knew it before he came here. Uh, additionally, I think I heard the gentleman from Ohio indicate that he would like to have the bill pulled today and further work done here before it votes out, and, and we certainly be willing to do that. Although I will say on behalf of uh, Mr. Schock, he, he did everything he could to inform the other side. We simply, after agreeing to four amendments, we were unable to, to reach agreement on the Fifth Amendment. I've got to be honest, in committee work between Republicans and Democrats, four out of five is a pretty good average. But I do believe that uh, Mr. Schock's uh, amendment is noteworthy, it's appropriate. If there are second degree amendments uh, that need to be added, I'm perfectly happy to have them added in this committee. If you're not prepared today, I'm perfectly happy to have us return. But I do believe that uh, the chairman is going to tell me that he'd like us to fish or cut bait today. If we have to fish or cut bait, we believe this amendment is good in its current form, and I'd urge support and yield back to the gentleman from Indiana. Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. I now recognize the gentlewoman from California. The shock Hi. amendment would kill this bill, 2142. If you read it carefully, that commission would be able to automatically abolish within one year those particular programs. Now, this bill should be a standalone, this amendment should be a standalone bill. I would ask the author of the amendment to not defeat 2142 because everything in it has been worked out. Bring it back as your bill, run it through the committee process, let us discuss how programs get defunded and automatically are abolished. This could impact many different segments of society, our veterans and so on. So we cannot do this in an amendment. It should not be part of this bill. And we should have, I would suggest, you have your own bill, and we can debate it and run it through the process like we do any other major piece of legislation. And if we vote on this amendment, my vote is no. Okay. The question is on the adoption of the uh, shock amendment. Will the, will the, will the, the chairman yield? All of the favor says aye, ah, and we've been in the vote process. Yeah. Yeah, I want a roll call. Oh, yeah, we're going to have a roll call. Yeah. Well, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Towns. Mr. Towns votes no. Mr. Kanjorski. Mrs. Maloney. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Tierney. Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Clay. Mr. Clay votes no. Ms. Watson? No. Ms. Watson votes no. Mr. Lynch? No. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Cooper? No. Mr. Cooper votes aye. Mr. Connolly? No. 
Mr. Connolly votes no. Mr. Quigley? Aye. Mr. Quigley votes aye. Ms. Kaptur? Ms. Norton? Mr. Kennedy? Mr. Davis? Mr. Van Hollen? Mr. Cuellar? No. Mr. Cuellar votes no. Mr. Hodes? Mr. Murphy? Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Welch? Mr. Foster? Ms. Uh, Mr. Foster votes no. Ms. Spear? Ms. Spear votes no. Mr. Driehaus? Mr. Driehaus votes no. Ms. Chu? Ms. Chu votes no. Mr. Issa? Yes. Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Souter? Mr. Duncan? Mr. Duncan votes aye. Mr. Turner? Mr. Westmoreland? Mr. McHenry? Mr. Bilbray? Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Jordan votes aye. Mr. Flake? Aye. Mr. Flake votes aye. Mr. Fortenberry? Mr. Florton, Fortenberry votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz? Mr. Schock? Aye. Mr. Schock votes aye. Mr. Luke Meyer? Aye. Mr. Luke Meyer votes aye. Mr. Gow? Mr. Van Hollen, I don't have you recorded. Mr. Van Hollen votes no. Welch. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes no. Any members that have not been recorded? Mr. Chaffetz? Mr. Chaffetz? Yes. Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Any other members? The clerk will report. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there are 16 no's, there are 11 ayes. The no's have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any other amendments? Hearing none, the question is on agreeing to the Cuellar substitute amendment as amended by the other amendments that have been adopted. All those in favor say aye. Aye. As amended, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 2142 as amended is agreed to without objection. H.R. 2142 as amended is ordered, reported favorably to the House. Mr. Chairman? Did, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. How, Ms. Norton has been recorded. I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the no vote be reflected in the records of uh, Mrs. Norton. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. I, I just want unanimous consent to put a letter in the record uh, endorsing our CTO bill that we previously Without had, objection, had so ordered. I thank the chair. Our final order of business is marking up several post office naming bills and commemorative resolutions. I ask unanimous consent that these resolutions and bills be considered in block and read and open to amendment at any time. The clerk will designate the bills. HR, uh, HRES 1121, congratulating Clinton County and the county seat of Wilmington, Ohio. On the I have occasion. a manager's amendment at the desk to make technical corrections to HR Res 1330, and I ask unanimous consent that it be adopted and considered as base text without objection to order. Having satisfied the committee's criteria, each of these measures are worthy of support, and I therefore urge their adoption. Does the ranking member have any comments on these bills? Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask to be recognized. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to thank you for bringing these namings and postal, uh, postal namings and resolutions. We have reviewed these postal namings and resolutions and find they meet the requirements of the committee and yield back. 
Well, I, I ask unanimous consent that the measures previously designated and amended be reported favorably by the committee without objection. So ordered. This concludes our business for today. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes to all matters ordered reported without objection. So ordered. The committee stands adjourned. All right. Votes going.